and that's probably why I'm here at the podium today. That's enough background on me. Why don't we go down the list? I'm Lee Valentine. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Space Studies Institute. I'm a Director of x -Corps Aerospace and a Director of Orbital Outfitters Corporation, and I'm an advocate of the Space Frontier Foundation. <coughs> I'm David Maston, founder and CEO of Maston Space Systems, and we're a uh, small suborbital uh, provider uh, building suborbital launch, launch vehicles. I'm Dougal McLeese, the current manager of the Cruiser Program, the Commercial Reusable Suborbital Research Program, and uh, a small uh, consumer of the uh, new flight services that are coming. Um, my name is AC Trania. I'm president of SpaceWorks Commercial. Uh, we're part of a small consulting group in Atlanta and DC. Uh, we do advanced concepts work for NASA, the Air Force, commercial space. We have analyzed suborbital space, orbital space in terms of market demand, particular launch vehicle, and transportation services. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit more about near term, but also farther term evolutions of suborbital <coughs> space. Okay, very good. And AC wins the award for best socks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Dougal's the runner-up, by the way. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I think what, uh, what was said in the introduction by James is exactly true. So Borbital used to be looked at as a stepping stone to the big leagues. Fact is, uh, it's a big leagues of its own. It's its own destination. For science, for tourism, as a breakthrough app for commercial space flight, as a way of changing our thinking about access to space. We literally are on the verge, if safety allows it, that we could be flying thousands of people in space per year a few years from now, getting a chance to see the Earth from space altitudes to do real work, um, and hopefully to generate uh, commercial returns by dint of their work in space a few minutes at a time, several times per day, day after day, every week of the year, and hopefully from every continent on Earth. This suborbital revolution is the, almost the equivalent for human spaceflight of when we went in computing from computing that was rare with, PC, with mainframes to what was routine with PCs. So I'm very excited about it. Suborbital space is very close. It's closer than uh, Monterey Bay is from here. You can get there in a suborbital spacecraft in a matter of minutes, less time than we've been talking. Um, and I think it's going to really change the public's view of space flight because the public is going to be running into people who have flown in space everywhere they go. I think they'll see Super Bowl commercials made on suborbital flights. They'll see MTV videos on suborbital flights. I think that the uh, scientific benefits are going to be outstanding, particularly in microgravity and in the life sciences where we just never have had the kind of access that we're about to have. And so for all those reasons, I think it's really exciting. Um, Dave Maston is one of five suborbital space lines that are in formation uh, right now. x -Core is another. Blue Origin, Armadillo Aerospace, Virgin. In human spaceflight, we have five systems being developed simultaneously, all of them on the private dime. And then we have the government, and, and uh, Dougal is here to represent that. Um, I have... Uh, 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 I have a lot of admiration for what Dougal and his team here at Ames are doing. You know, when I was at, at NASA headquarters, Mike Griffin asked for commercialization ideas, and I came forward on behalf of science mission director and said, Mike, what do you say we buy 100 tickets on a suborbital line and start flying scientists? And he literally knocked on the back door of his office. Do you know the administrator has a back door so they can escape? From <laughs> <laughs> but that back door in uh, Mike Griffin's NASA actually led to Shanna Dale's office. He said, Shanna, come in here. What do you think of this idea of Alan's? And she said, I think that's a great idea. And so we agreed we would go do it. This was in 2007. And about a month later, I got to meet Richard Branson and, and uh, uh, Will Whitehorn that was uh, uh, at the time responsible for uh, beginning to put together Virgin Galactic brought Branson in the room with me and a couple of my aides. And the four of us sat down and he introduced me and he said, uh, uh, Sir Richard, this man's going to buy 100 tickets from you. And Branson fell to his knees in front of me. I thought, this is not happening. He fell in front of me. He picked up my right leg and began shining my shoe with his... <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is what happened. And he looked up at me and said, what can I do for you? 
Now, being a government employee, I knew that it's very easy to get tagged by the inspector general that you don't want to say, well, I really like a yacht. <laughs> so I, thinking quickly, I said, I hear you know Bono. I'd like to meet Bono. <laughs> and he stood up and he said, tell you what, you buy 100 tickets, you're having dinner with Bono. So uh, that's a little bit of my introduction to suborbital. We'll talk more about um, brass tacks later, but why don't we just go down the list and uh, each person can make their thoughts for a few minutes. Where do we want to start? Want to start at AC's end? Take the long view? Or if you're more comfortable and you want to come up here, you can do that. Do we have a clicker and slides? Pass that down. There you go. You want to stand here? Yeah, come on up. Um, so yeah, I'll quickly take a few minutes. I've got a few slides, so I won't, I, I won't bore you with this. Um, all right, so what we do at Spaceworks Commercial, as I quickly mentioned, we work with entrepreneurs. We have some of our own ideas. We've got some other stuff going on in suborbital orbital space I'm not going to talk about today, but you can talk to me later about that. Um, okay, so suborbital human transportation commercial. Um, some data just to introduce the topic. Um, this is from a few years ago, probably more stale data than we currently have, but in terms of some estimates of potential demand, and that's what I'm interested in. Not being an optimist or a pessimist, but a realist in terms of this market. Um, so the big question and one of my following uh, concluding points will be not what is happening now, which is very exciting, but what is going to happen in five years? That's what I tend to look at. Um, so we're looking at what is the growth of this market in terms of does it follow these paths of microprocessors? Does it follow the path of, uh, of other kinds of uh, innovations? And that's the big question for us in terms of when we look at suborbital space on the human side. Um, I'm here representing the Fast Forward Project, which is a NACA-style study group that is looking at uh, kind of post-suborbital transportation, post-suborbital point A, point E, but looking at point a to point B transportation and thinking that once the suborbital uh, market that these gentlemen will talk about evolves, um, can we get to a global high-speed point-to-point transportation uh, kind of network? Um, so you have different various ways of traveling in the atmosphere and in space, point-to-point uh, -point using different options of these kinds of uh, ways of getting from one point to another. Uh, these are some of the logos of some of the people, organizations who are on our Fast Forward project team. Um, looking at point-to-point -point transportation, some of these are the suborbital folks. Uh, some of them are more traditional aerospace companies. Um, so we're kind of doing a NACA type of process of bringing folks together, talking about what do we mean by suborbital, but also the evolution of suborbital to point to point. Uh, so we're doing this on our own dime as a company and trying to bring folks together to talk about this and get better knowledge. Um, some objectives of our fast forward project, market assessment, regulatory issues, flight options, um, challenges for aerospace ports, um, and how the government can play in all this. Um, and there's various kind of trade space options in terms of technologies, ranges, Mach numbers, um, that suborbital transportation options today and in the future we'll have to address. And my final slide, which is more pertinent to this, uh, uh, the topic Alan brought up is, um, we see maybe a long-term overlapping of technologies both on the hypersonic, supersonic, and space access side to help suborbital human space transportation. There are additional markets beyond human commercial space transportation, which is some of the early markets such as research, government and commercial research. But um, there are current a lot of suborbital issues in terms of our perspective, in terms of uncertainties. There's, uh, I know people have put down money, f deposits, and full amounts for Spaceship Two. My uncertainty is in the mar market projections and Futron Zagby and other things, what is the long-term viability of that market? I know we believe there are pioneers that have put down money, but after those pioneers, is this a sustainable service in terms of commercial human suborbital transportation? We have a question on that from the analysis we've done. Um, there's, a, there's a certain um, lack of confidence that happens when you have a, this mature product and over time the price, does the price decrease? How much does the price decrease from $200,000? Does it decrease to a financially viable product and that can bring in more people beyond these pioneers? This dual focus uh, that Alan mentioned on more cargo, both co commercial and government. Um, so our question is, is that a transition from the near-term commercial uh, person Per personnel travel to maybe more dedicated cargo services. What's, what's the impact of that? There is going to be talk, and these gentlemen will talk about cruiser. 
Um, there is some uncertainty with Cruiser in terms of, yes, it is a revenue augmentation kind of device, financial device by the government for these providers, but what is the long-term viability of Cruiser um, and what is the use of Cruiser for uh, on the human side on, on the near term versus maybe a more NASA focused on a dedicated payload side without people on the sub suborbital research side. So there are some uncertainties. Um, so I think our perspective is there's, um, there are elements here that are very ex uh, things to be very excited at, but beyond the, what will be publicly visible in one or two years in terms of Spaceship Two, there are some other things in terms of cargo, in terms of research, um, that we, we hope will keep the suborbital transportation market growing because we have big questions on whether the people who have put down money for Spaceship Two, what are the generation of consumers after that? And will the next generation of services and government support and government launches on these systems make up for what we believe will be a um, uncertain and maybe downward level of uh, kind of commercial private adventure tourists beyond the pioneers that have put down money already. So those are some of the questions we are wrestling with. Uh, one of the solutions would be better publicly available market surveys post follow on to Futron Zogby and other things, and maybe better handles on the synergies of NASA's cruiser um, and human intended cruiser pro programs on these companies in this market. So those would be my quick perspectives. So. Thank you very much. That was great, AC. Let's thank him. AC made a provocative point uh, that, uh, that we may see a burst of interest in tourism and then it's going to be tough to sell tickets. Um, I don't think that's the case. I have a question I've asked at other meetings, but this, this one's it's a little bit loaded. But if you um, uh, plan to save money for a suborbital flight, would you please stand up? Let's just see. Uh, really, if, you do, if you're not planning to save money, don't stand up. Yeah, if you've already saved money, please. If, if, if you're planning to have a ticket, if you have a ticket, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty fair representation. It's not a representative sample. I'll make my point. This is, not a, this is not a representative audience, but, you know, I asked the same question uh, in Washington, D.C. about a month ago at an entrepreneur's conference, and actually a, lot more, a much higher fraction of people in the room stood up. I think the key is going to be safety and lower and lower price points. And then I think we'll see a real market develop. But um, AC will do his own studies. So, Dougal, why don't you come up and tell us about Cruiser? Okay. A um, couple of things. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think this is very heartening for us that are trying to get this whole process going and have been working in this industry for quite a while. Uh, contrary to some of the opinions from NASA, I am a very, very firm believer in the commercialization of space. And all of the things that Alan said are very important to me as a uh, space worker for the past 20 years. Um, we just recently released a request for quotations to buy rides on the test flights of these new companies. Those are all due this afternoon at 1 o'clock. So if you haven't started, please hurry. <laughs> Um, we hope to make the selections and announcement in the next couple of weeks, if sooner. We hope to be flying in the next couple of months. That is what I call the beginning of the debutante year we're coming out. We started this year with a budget of one and a half million. We were very pleased to get an announcement in Boulder that the president is requesting 15 million. Actually, it started out at 15 billion, but we had to take a quick cut during the conference. <laughs> um, for each of the next five years, now, as Jim will tell you, what the president asks and what Congress delivers are often different, so we're still looking for this. But the latest is that it still looks very good. Best thing we can do is show what this industry can do, and we're trying to do that now. So we will be buying these flights. We're going to be flying a few preliminary payloads that will help us characterize the flights and help us develop some of the uh, rules of the road. The first payload will probably be something we call the space flight, in, or excuse me, suborbital flight environment monitor. It's a simple device that will measure the accelerations, vibration, temperature, pressure, loads, 
that any payload will have to survive to operate on these vehicles. And then as the flights mature, we start going to higher rates, they get licensed and under full operation, we'll collect information about the quality of the ride that we can use in science. There's a big issue. If you want to get microgravity, how good is microgravity? And actually, one of the challenges we're having is how to measure that. Most of the sensors we have can get down to what we call milligravity, thousands of a Earth-based gravity instead of millions. So we're trying to work this out. Uh, the other payload is going to be something that the FAA loaned us. It's called the ADSB, and I always have a problem with this acronym. <laughs> Automated Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. This is a portion of the new air traffic control process that we're going to be doing. It's a device that uses the GPS signals to locate itself. It monitors that, broadcasts it to the FAA, and help me if I say anything wrong, Michelle. Um, and then that is broadcast back to the other vehicles in the area so that everyone hopefully knows where everyone else is. This is, to me, critical if we're going to be flying aircraft in the same area that we're having these vehicles coming down from around 300,000 feet with flame shooting out the bottom. I think they would like to know what's coming down on them. Now, to me, one of the other really exciting things is next year, Cruiser will be joining the Office of the Chief Technologist and participating in the group called Flight Opportunities. This is going to be some of the real good, I think, and exciting times for NASA. Bobby Braun, the new Chief Technologist, has developed a program where we're really going to start working on developing new technologies and going some really interesting ways. He's got three areas, the, and John, help me if I forget some of these, cross-cutting areas, game-changing, and say it again, early innovation. Early innovation. Um, and I always forget the order. But what we call TRL, technology readiness level, we will start at the very basic low ones with lots of proposals and lots of chances to try these out. They're going to award a lot of um, grants or uh, projects to these in small dollar amounts where people can start developing the idea and seeing if it really fits, if it can go somewhere. Then they, the ones that succeed, will graduate to the next level or people that come in with ideas at the mid-TRLs will bring their ideas in, will be funding projects in there, fewer but higher dollar, so they can go ahead. And then we will have the last bit where they start to fly them on all these vehicles in the uh, parabolic flights with companies like Zero G and on these flights, the suborbital flights, to prepare them to go into full orbital space or beyond Earth orbit. This is where I think NASA really gets a kick start and we really begin to do the innovation that we did so well in the past, and honestly, everyone I've met has all these ideas on how to do this, and I think it's going to be a very exciting time for NASA. Um, part of that is a change in the management of the cruiser operations, which actually I'm very pleased to see. It's going to move down to Dryden Flight Research Center, who is been working on flights both in experimental aircraft like the X-15 and a lot of the others to the return of the shuttle. This is our original shuttle landing site. It's a great field to operate from uh, for those of us that uh, might consider the Edwards Air Force Base field and it's a golden opportunity to bring more people into the fray. It's very close to the Mojave Airport's good transition. Ames will continue the role of monitoring the payloads and helping to develop that. Now along, in that, along the lines of those, what we plan to do is work with the industry to figure out how to streamline this process. Come up with the uh, payload carriers that will help us integrate payloads quickly and safely. We're also going to be working with the uh, safety people at Ames and Dryden to figure out the best way to approve these payloads for flights. We want to make sure that the payloads don't harm anyone on the ground around the vehicle, they don't harm the vehicle, and they don't interfere with other payloads. We're trying to figure out how to do that. And the nice thing is this whole
process is built on what we call build a little, test a little, and try again. So we're going to be learning as we go. Um, I've already learned in the first request for quotations. We will be doing these again, and we will probably be expanding the area that they uh, will qualify. Um, we put some stri uh, tight um, restrictions on this that we'll be opening up in the future and uh, should bring in a lot more new companies. And the other part is that we will be developing the request for proposals for broad um, blanket purchase agreements, uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity type contracts. That is the plan at this time. And those will be buying a lot of rides for us to use to demonstrate new technologies and uh, start doing research in some new parts of the atmosphere that we haven't spent a lot of time in. So I'm really looking forward to this and uh, interested in all your questions. Thank you. Dougal's one of the white hats in this, uh, this entire development. Uh, and uh, I want to say I resonated with a lot of things Jim Munsey just said a little bit earlier, but I will tell you that there are many people, Dougal and his team not among them, uh, in NASA uh, that do not want to see Cruiser be successful. They have other vested interests. Um, one of the things that Dougal has been pinned down on by foes of this program uh, is you never heard him mention flying scientists or researchers in space or educators or people at all. There are people that want spaceflight to remain the, the purview of elite astronauts, even at the suborbital level. And he's got to fight that fight because that's where the real breakthrough and the cross-cutting and that's where the game-changing comes. The game-changing comes when we have thousands of people whose data is in the database on zero-g adaptation or when we quit automating spaceflight experiments uh, and instead put the researcher in the loop like in every other lab, in every other field in science. That's where game changing comes. And that's what I want you to be working on too. And I know you're taking a lot of flack for it, but that's what we want to see is the opening up of suborbital from just payloads to also people. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Okay, next up, uh, we're gonna hear from uh, Dave Mastin. Come on up here. Always something interesting to say. I have to apologize. I might not have too much uh, interesting to say. I've been uh, up way too late last night working on uh, getting a response to an RFQ out. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are actually going to be one of the, one of the first, if not the first, uh, to uh, provide uh, the payload services, we hope. Um, we are pretty much ready. We did have to do a little extra work because of the tight restrictions. Um, you know, cabin environment? <laughs> Um, but so anyway, it, it's uh, it's very exciting. This whole this whole suborbital thing is, is very exciting, and I'm I'm going to actually disagree with Alan about the the game changing changing part. What's really game changing is that all of us uh, who are who are doing the suborbital vehicles are making them so that instead of flying once every six months, schedule six years in advance, we are doing it. Yeah, schedule it six weeks in advance. Maybe we might even do six days in advance. And how many flights do you want? We'll give you two, three, four, five in a day. Um, and that's really what's going to be game changing is, is the number of opportunities. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people and, and just the idea that, wait a minute, you mean we can go up and sample upper atmosphere five times during the day? We can do that in the morning when, the, when we think the thermosphere is doing this. We can do it in the... Uh, evening when we think the mesosphere is doing something completely different, um, that's going to be what's really game changing. And uh, so I want to keep this really short. <laughs> Thank you. And I agree with you. There are a lot of game changing aspects and the, the frequency, the low cost of access is definitely a part of that. I completely agree and I hope you got your proposal turned in that you're not going to try and squeeze it in between this panel and lunch. <laughs> Let's turn to Lee Valentine and bring this home. What we want from suborbital is private space flight, low cost earth observation and scientific and research missions. What we really want 
if the clicker works, is satellite solar power, protection from asteroid impact, space colonies, asteroid mining. What we need for that is a mature space transportation system. That means a mature system is a high duty cycle. Uh, you make money by keeping your capital equipment in uh, play. Uh, there we go. It's got to be reliable and safe. And a characteristic of a mature transportation system is that the cost of transportation is a small multiple of the fuel cost. And this implies that suborbital tourism for the price of a small car and for orbital cargo at $100 a pound. A mature suborbital space flight will enable a mature orbital system. Orbital flight has really three engineering problems, punching out of the atmosphere, accelerating in space, slamming back into the atmosphere, and landing safely. For rockets, the second is easy. For suborbital flight, like orbital flight, requires solving the other two engineering problems. The, the uh, critical uh, technology for both of those is safe, reliable, efficient, and highly reusable rocket engines. In fact, there's so much overlap that one commercial suborbital spacecraft, the X-Core Lynx, will launch small satellites, and we expect that to occur in about two years. Suborbital spaceflight will pay for itself. Remember, the characteristic cost is a single-digit multiple of fuel cost. There will be multiple revenue streams, private spaceflight, Earth observation, and other scientific and engineering missions. And at the price a mature system can offer, there will be no shortage of spaceflight customers. A mature suborbital enables orbital. It allows rapid development and exhaustive testing of thermal protection systems, avionics, and reaction control systems. It gives the operators real-world experience. It allows them to build regulatory experience. Right, Michelle? There you go. Uh, indeed, low-cost mature suborbital flight is the only way to test frequently enough to develop the low-cost mature orbital system. I'm just going to make a couple of comments about the design of these vehicles. They've got to be designed as a system for low-cost operations. Safety requires exhaustive flight test, and only low-cost operations allow sufficient testing, and that's contrary to the noise coming out of some senatorial offices in Washington. A low-cost system has to be safe. If it's not, if it's not, the operator cannot afford insurance or the spacecraft replacement cost. Use a pilot. A pilot actor adds a factor of 10 to 100 in safety and lower development cost. Low-cost propellants are preferred. Hypergolics are unacceptable. Long-life engines are essential. The engines are the high capital cost component, and that means you need thousands of flights per engine not dozens, and composite cryogenic tanks are desirable. The future for mature space flight looks very bright from my perspective. Mature suborbital will lead to mature orbital via low-cost flight test, and the world will be a different place. Thank you. Well, as you've heard, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, ways this can go and a lot of ways it will go. The, the great thing about suborbital from my standpoint is that it, uh, people look at it and they see themselves in the mirror. Researchers see an opportunity for research. Tourists and entrepreneurs see opportunities to fly themselves or to start a new business. Um, developers see things like uh, very high uh, rates of flight in order to test equipment for orbital. Uh, so there are a lot of threads in this. There are a lot of possibilities. One of the things that really excites me is that with the price points that suborbital is going to have and the frequency of flights with different manufacturers, that space flight's not just going to be the purview of one agency or maybe one public agency and a few black agencies, but many, many agencies in this country. Um, I fully expect that on the research side, five years from now, we'll see 
NIH, not only flying experiments, but probably flying test subjects, that we'll see DARPA doing that, that we'll see the National Science Foundation flying space flights, that we'll see perhaps NOAA flying space flights, and other agencies I haven't mentioned. But moreover, at the price of roughly 10 to the fifth dollars, that's where we're, we're entering the market, um, w things are low enough that we can expect a lot of countries to get in this game as well. If you look on Wikipedia, there are 194 nations on Earth. Let's assume that number's right. Wikipedia also gives you a chance to look at the GDPs of every country on Earth. And so I did a little calculation. I converted the cost of a Soyuz seat, $50 million for NASA, for the U.S. government, um, into an equivalent fraction of our GDP. And then I multiplied that by the cost of a ticket on Virgin, $200,000. And I asked myself, what nations on Earth could afford a suborbital seat for the same fraction of their GDP that we put into buying a Soyuz seat? I got six nations below the Aruba. 146 nations on Earth can afford to fly suborbital and have their own spaceflight programs by that standard. Now, Aruba's GDP is small. I live in Boulder, Colorado. Their GDP is one-third the GDP of Boulder County, Colorado. All right? So spaceflight can be ubiquitous among the nations of Earth that have a desire at these price points. So my question for the, the panel is, is uh, to ask you to make a tough prediction. Four years from now, in 2014, how many suborbital flights will be flown? Lee? I would say many thousands. More than a thousand, less than a hundred thousand. What do you think, Dave? Uh, I'm going to agree with that. that assessment. It's a wide range. <laughs> it's going to be the thousand. Per year. Very good. Dougal. Uh, I think, honestly, it's going to be a bit less. I think the market is going to, there's going to be some up and down with it. I think the suppliers will be ready. I think the market will be ready. I'm not sure the regulatory agencies will be ready. And that's, going to be an interesting push when we go back and forth. It's something we have to work out. How do we do this? Um, that's the fun part of the government, is trying to encourage this and not, um, how did Jeff Greeson put it? Not letting all the bad people in that can really screw it up for the industry. AC, yeah, sure. AC, what do you think? Uh, I would say, 100 to 500 flights annually. Price points, I would find difficult to get below $100,000 at those flight rates. Maybe given certain technology assumptions and certain approaches by certain companies. Um, I would also predict that a lot of, as I mentioned, I think the initial first years of Spaceship 2 will be commercial, and as Mast and others come on board, um, if you look at the total revenue in, in the market of suborbital transportation for humans and cargoes, it will be this $15 million from Cruiser a few years from now, maybe a little more, maybe 20, maybe some other monies from other agencies. I would then also say the commercial portion of suborbital transportation will be about the same. I would find it difficult that it's probably two or three times the, tw the $20 million in Cruiser. So I, I can foresee you know, some, some of that going on. Maybe that leads to 100 flights a year or 500 flights a year. Um, but So I think it's something new. It will be a system. I do think this will be a sustainable transportation market. Now, in terms of thousands or 10,000 flights a year, or 50,000 passengers per year, or 10,000 passengers, I'm a little more skeptical. But I do think this will be a sustainable market four years from now. I mean, we'll say this was not a fluke. This was not just Spaceship Two going for two years. The government sees utility. Other people see utility. So I, I am, I'm happy that there will be this new uh, service, and it will be partly government, uh, government customers, public customers. One more comment from Dougal. I think one of the things here that I'd like to stress is I don't know, I foresee that we'll have thousands of payloads. Um, and some of those may be people. Um, but I think the price rates that we're looking at, we were asking about price per kilogram. That opens up a whole new thing. We've got some very small payloads that could go. And actually, there's a possibility of a ton of student <coughs> payloads that could go on these and really start inspiring the next generation. Yeah, I concur with you. But to, to recap, what we heard were the pessimists, if you call them that. I don't even think they're pessimists, but the low end 
Um, we heard people uh, thinking it might be hundreds of flights per year, and at the high end, thousands or many thousands. I'd like to make a statement about the difference between price and cost. So the prices quoted are the prices that the operators think the market, initial market will bear. But I can tell you that we have very good data, both Dave Maston's company and ours down the tarmac at Mojave, about how much it's going to cost to fly these vehicles because we have precursors that have already flown. So we have good engineering data on the cost models. And there's a huge difference between the cost and the price. So there's a big, big range to drop that price if necessary to ensure that we're flying repeatedly, which we have to do. Well, you're reading my mind, and I want to ask the panel two more questions, then we're going to go to the audience. And in fact, the next one is to make a prediction now for the same year, four years from now, it's the summer of 2014, uh, what will it cost for a seat or seat equivalent mass cost to fly, uh, average in the market? Lee? Um, I think it's going to be under $50,000 in 2015. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not quite that... Uh well, depending on which side of the equation you're on, uh, optimistic or pessimistic, um, I think it's going to be closer to uh, seventy-five or hundred thousand. Dougal, you have a prediction? I only, I have fun looking at some of the prices online when I started this, and seeing it per kilogram, I soon realized that you would get away a lot cheaper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> AC. Hundred thousand. Okay, fifty to hundred thousand dollars, which is way down. From uh, $200,000, that's for sure. You know, I was at a SEDS meeting about a year and a half ago, and uh, uh, one of the kids asked me, how could I ever afford $200,000 space flight? I told them, I said, when you, when you get out of college and get your job, uh, start living on $1,000 a month less um, than whatever you're paid. Save it up. Put it in the bank. Interest will help. Uh, and in about eight years, uh, you'll have $200,000 if you invest it wisely, if you invest uh, very wisely. Um, I said, but in about, in, in about eight years, though, uh, when you take your money out, I expect that you'll take $50,000 and buy a ticket, and you can take that other 50000 and put it in your first house or buy a second ticket, because I think the prices are also going to be down around that range, substantially below $100,000. Last question I want to ask of the group before we turn it over to you guys is what do you think the dominant market sector will be in 2014? When we're flying hundreds to thousands of flights, Prices are in the range of, let's say, fifty or seventy-five or hundred thousand dollars per seat or seat equivalent. Is it going to be research? Is it going to be tourism? Is it going to be something else? What do you think, Lee? I have to say that there are a lot more people who are not scientists uh, who want to fly in space than there are scientists with developed payloads ready to go. Now, I, I think that the scientific payload market is going to increase because of the opportunity offered. But I think that, uh, that we're going to see uh, a lot of people from all walks of life who really want to fly in space. Their families and friends have done it, They're, and, and they want to do it too. And the price will be right. Well, I think you're right on the point that, that a lot of people want to fly in space. When I went to the Virgin Spaceship 2 rollout, uh, I expected that most of the people, or virtually everyone I would meet, uh, had, had really become very successful in life and that this wasn't a very big expense. And the very first Virgin ticket holder that I met that, that evening when I walked in uh, was an Irish businessman, and we got to talking, and what he told me is he always wanted to fly in space, and he was spending half his life savings on that ticket. I think there's a lot of pent-up demand by just regular people. What do you think, Dave? Oh, it's a tough question. Uh, porn. Dave's <laughs> user. Um, it, it's a contribution. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, look at, look at the Internet. Porn is the biggest user of the Internet. Um, so, you know, if it's going to be a successful business, probably porn will have something to do with it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Dave, you're going to have to build a bigger rocket. You, you're going to have to start press I'm not pressurizing. Not, we're, you know, we're, we're not flying people for a while. Um, <laughs> Dave, I think you're on the cover of the long magazine. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's hear some government wisdom from well, you. Yeah, yeah. I think you've said, you've said quite enough right now. <laughs> that's a serious answer. Um, I thought it would be about 50-50 commercial government on the AC. Um, what I really am encouraged about, price coming down, there's going to be a lot of scientists flying 
experiments in the space. And for the agency, for the country, that side, it's going to be very interesting. I do think there's another market that somebody here has brought up quite a while ago, where we're going to be flying things like a load of Beanie Babies in the space that you can then turn around and say, these are the Beanie Baby astronauts that have gone to space. I want one of those for my grandchild that's on there. Okay, very good. Um, I, uh, I would say probably 50-50, as I mentioned before. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, the providers will be slightly different in offering a different service. So you can imagine the Virgin product, the service, the Mastin product, or the Armadillo, or the x -Corp product. Those are slightly different vehicles, probably slightly different price points, offering a slightly different experience for both payloads and people. Um, so the $100,000 I mentioned previously, I think, some of those providers will offer that, some of those will not, because they're offering slightly different services. So there'll be some competition on quality of service uh, for payloads and people. Um, I, and so, yes, I, think, I think it's split 50-50 uh, most. And I think it will, it will there is still, I fundamentally have this question of these people, yes, who right now put in half their life savings, and I would classify that person as a pioneer. But I still question five years from now, after operational services, the, uh, the, the freshness of that experience in the public mind for a pioneer to go and, uh, to put down half their life savings five, six years from now. So I, I, just, I do still question that. I also think, so I think a model we can use is probably tradition, I mean, current orbital transportation. Cargo. That's you know a lot of commercial stuff goes up, a lot of government stuff goes up, and I think that's something that we'll, we can see on the orbital side with different vehicles providing different levels of service at slightly different price points. Okay, very good. All provocative thoughts. I want to uh, take issue with one thing that Lee said, uh, or at least uh, add something to it. You said you think that a lot less scientists will fly than than tourists, for example. I'm not sure if I agree with that point, but what I do know is there will be a characteristic that's different. In the we research want, market, we want more scientists to fly. The, my, <laughs> my point is, in the research market, and when you fly your experiment, you're probably going to fly it a lot of times, right? Uh, you're going to take your furnace experiment up there, and maybe you're going to get a NASA grant that's going to give you 50 trials on that experiment. Or if you're a space life sciences person, you're trying to see what makes people sick and doesn't get sick. There are going to be a lot of trials in that flight, or an astronomer, what have you. Whereas I think the typical tourist will fly once, some will fly twice, a few will take their family. A very small number will want to try every vehicle in sight and make sure they've flown it both night and day. But that'll be rare. I think you'll see that the research market, whether they're engineers or scientists and also the educators, will fly lots of flights for specific purpose. And that'll be a different characteristic. But let's turn it open to the crowd now. We'll start way over here on the left with the lady in the fourth row. Hi, my name is Megan Stills. I'm an educator, and I'm actually also a part of the Teachers in Space project. We've been very lucky to have had four of the five companies that you mentioned donate flights to us, with the exception of Virgin, because for some reason they want to fly British teachers first. I'm not really sure why. Um, but my question is, when do you realistically see a manned suborbital space flights actually happening and getting through the red tape? And then B, when and where do you foresee teachers falling into that lineup when you're comfortable enough with the delicate situation of putting a teacher into a high-risk situation? Okay, great question. And uh, for all the questions, just a point of order. Uh, we'll take one or two answers. We won't get all five of us to answer every question so we can get through a lot of questions. Who wants to tackle this one? Well, I'll take that first because uh, uh, x -Corp plans to fly the Lynx in about 12 months to begin the test flight program. Uh, we have begun construction of the vehicle. The engines are done. Uh, the test flight program will take as long as it takes. That'll be sometime between 6 and 12 months. Uh, when that test flight program is over, then everybody in the company flies on the vehicle. Then the big investors fly. So Esther and I will be flying in that group. Um, then after that, the first commercial ticket holder will fly. Then we'll fly those ticket holders. Uh, that'll take a couple of weeks, maybe. And then the teachers in space have got their slot somewhere in there after the first commercial flights have uh, commenced. So expect about more than a year and a half uh, and less than two years, two and a half. 
Yeah, my answer would be 12 or 13 as well, whatever the, uh, the way the test programs work out in the different vehicles. Okay, we'll take a question right up front, and then we'll come this over here. Be a hard, but can you make an estimate of the steady state demand? For, uh, can you make an estimate of the steady state demand for, for suborbital tourism in the absence of orbital vehicles at different price points, say 100,000, 50,000, and 10,000 annual demand? This is after the pioneers are done. So how steeply will the demand go up as the prices drop? Is that your yeah, question? Yeah, and, and best numbers you can come up with. Who wants to take a crack at it? Uh, I wish I knew the answer to that question. That's something that you have to wrestle with as an entrepreneur in this space. AC? Um, I would say from our, and I don't have the numbers, and we go to our website, we've got some papers on this, but I think our general assessment was that $103,000 is not enough to bring enough people. $100,000 is not enough. But we thought, we think $50,000 is a price point to really expand the marketplace. Now, the actual number, I can't remember from the top of my head. I mean, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions? Not hundreds of thousands of people, I would say. Uh, like 10,000 people. Okay. $50,000. How do we do that? Uh, because there are just a certain, some I mean, uh, there are a certain oh, number of people, one, good. of the global population who can afford this, even if they put down half their life savings. Boom. There are a certain number who can physically do it. There are a certain number who have the time to do it. Um, so you start slicing off the population, then you get to the subset of potential consumers. Then with that same money, they can also spend, they have alternatives for that money, right? So that's why I, we have a difficult time perceiving 100,000 people per year, even with repeat customers. But at $50,000, I think Which guy in the back? you can get, with a higher probability, you know, multiple thousands. But a lot of uncertainty, and this is my last point, which was the best data we have, publicly available data, was happened before the X Prize flight, and sorry, the X Prize flight, and so there's a need for better public information or additional service surveys of these populations. And some of the companies have done this or have their internal numbers, uh, but for the overall marketplace, it may be useful to get some the numbers you're exactly talking about, all right? The price elasticity of demand, which I think is very interesting. Okay, as many of you may know, we're actually broadcasting this on the web, and we have a question from a chat room. Absolutely. Quantum G would like to know, will there be some advantage to being the first suborbital provider to fly? If not, can we create one to spur a race? We have a race out in Mojave, and the dark horse is likely to win. <laughs> Anyone else want to get on that? So, so here's, here's a real issue. Uh, Microsoft was not the first operating system for uh, personal computers. And look where they are. Um, being first is not necessarily, uh, being first has one advantage, but over the long term, it's not such an advantage. It's, uh, it really, when you look over all the industries and everything, it boils down to, you got, what do you have in terms of a service? Is it the best, is it the best price point? Are you providing the best value to your customer? And that's what really matters. And uh, just uh, every, every time that a bunch of us uh, suborbital providers get together at, at conferences or whatnot, and, and we're sort of uh, getting up and, and telling everybody what great and wonderful things we can do, uh, I've noticed there's been some competition on, on the value, uh, value front. And, uh, you know, each conference, something gets a little bit better on their vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, let's return in the room. The gentleman in the back. Yes, sir. Excellent question. When are we going to see the ads start coming out? I think uh, uh, we are, uh, I, can, I can speak for x Aerospace in that regard, and we are constrained uh, in the way Richard Branson is not uh, by finances. Uh, and Sir Richard has a big enterprise that he can use Virgin as, Virgin Galactic as uh, as an advertising vehicle and amortize his investment in that way, whereas uh, uh, XCOR and Maston and Armadillo don't have that same advantage. 
I do think that there'll be a lot of free publicity when the vehicles start flying test flights and start flying their early pioneers. Uh, but anybody else want to get in on this one? Uh, I think on the question of Virgin, Virgin has been successful because the people at Virgin, in essence, Virgin is a, is a branding company with all, the, all of its multiple brands. So they are experts in that kind of process. I would also say something to our detriment is that we, the aerospace community, sometimes are not very good at branding, marketing, communication. The FAA is helping with that in terms of um, facilitating, educating the public. But we have industry groups like the Commercial Space Flight Federation trying to do that as well. Um, but it's a nascent industry, and even in the marketing, it's somewhat nascent. So. But I think so, it's somewhat nascent. nascent. I've never seen an ad in anything I've ever read that says, come fly with us. Yeah, exactly. Never one ad. Yeah. Somewhat nascent. OK, yeah. over here. <laughs> Uh, I'd encourage uh, both the audience uh, uh, questionnaires and the speakers to use your microphones, otherwise the uh, web audience isn't going to hear us. Uh, and uh, I guess my question has to do with uh, regulatory risk, and it's uh, specifically for AC. Uh, can you model regulatory risk and uh, invert those models to actually extract the uh, projected uh, present value of an investment in buying down regulatory risk through one of these policy groups? But um, I would say yes, and we actually proposed that to the FAA a few years ago. And, uh, we, we, we didn't get to do that. But, but in, our, in our simulations and models, we have done that. For instance, modeling, it, modeling multiple suborbital space tourism companies, then modeling failure and modeling uh, a dampening in demand and modeling a certain cost to failure in terms of regul regulatory costs for the entire industry and assessing probabilistically what is the impact on the company's fin finances. So we have, our company has done stuff like that, um, and we can do stuff like that, and try to quantify, monetize um, kind of regulation. You know, if I'm overly regulatory, there's certain costs to meet that regulation, but because of that, the overall industry is safer, so there's a lower overall pro probability of a failure in the future that helps the industry. So there's a near-term cost of implementing regulation, but that helps in the long term. So what's the trade-off? Uh, I don't have a number, but we have done, st we can do stuff like that, and uh, those that is important going forward in terms of uh, financially. What is the impact of regulation, and how and how much should it be? And that's I see the, the whole industry needs to have. I see the government guy can't wait to get in on the regulation question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's the regulation side. What? we're hoping to do is work with the industry much like NACA did in the early years to look at the technologies that would help reduce the cost of operations some of that is regulation <coughs> excuse me some of that is improving the likelihood that a mishap will be mitigated one of the things we'd like to do is find a way to retrieve payloads uh, much like a crew aboard system now that's on the um, was developed for the Ares One system, but now for payloads, uh, is there things we can do to help them turn around vehicles faster? We've been working on a system called the Integrated Vehicle Health Management. These are things that'll help them operate cheaper and can bring down the cost, and then NASA can buy more rides, uh, fly more things, and maybe people. Question over here. Yes. Front row. Barnhart, National Space Society. There's been a lot of talk in the past few weeks on uh, Capitol Hill concerning funding for uh, the uh, cruiser program and you know what what really matters with respect to getting uh, you know moving some activity forward there. What could be done? that essentially could make the point that growing the ecosystem of companies participating in this is a win for NASA, it's a win for this nation, it's a win for the space movement. Who wants to tackle that? Right now, I think the biggest thing that we can do for all of this is start flying. Do it. Yes, so I think well it was right on, right on the mark with that. So I've been a big part of the battles the last few weeks on, on the Hill. I've been out to Washington several times in just the last month. Um, we, we mobilized several hundred people to start making phone calls uh, for suborbital. 
They, they thought this wasn't an issue. They got several hundred phone calls. And uh, good people like Jim Muncy and others who actually know how to work on Capitol Hill uh, were all over it in the past week. And we actually triumphed. Cruiser got fully funded. Uh, but it is a battle because there are those who want to protect entrenched interests. I think Google is exactly right. We need to make the point moot by getting out there flying, getting results. Economic results, there, there are profitable companies, and, and research results, educators that are out there increasing STEM education by going into classrooms and saying, I flew, here's my experiment that I was doing in space. You can fly in space. You can be a part of something exciting. We need to get flying. And we're right on the heels of that. I know we're all ready. We're ready. But I think the next year is really going to change the game. And the next two years is going to blow people away. Question right here. Uh, Richard? I'm Richard. I'm Richard Maines. Uh, full disclosure, I'm actually working on Cruiser as well. But um, one of the issues that I've, I hear buzz about here and I've heard words about is operations. And my guess is that the minute we start flying and the minute this thing begins to go up, the operational issue is going to become the next big giant issue. Uh, it's got to be streamlined. It's got to be simplified. And this kind of a payload processing thing from the beginning to the very, very end, which involves all kinds of companies that develop payloads, that know about logistics, that, that understand how Southwest Airline works and all this kind of stuff who need to join this effort with, you know, commercial ventures. So uh, I would strongly encourage people who are kind of waiting for that to happen to try to join this effort and figure out how do we streamline this. And that's a big, big focus within uh, Cruiser right now. Okay, point well taken. Other questions? This, I've been ignoring you right there. Please go ahead. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Dave Brody with Space.com, proud sponsor of this conference I'm with a lot of other partners. Uh, and also, full disclosure, uh, advocate of the Space Frontier Foundation. So back in May, I heard you use the words uh, ubiquitous space access. You used the word ubiquitous again today. When we in the media hear that word, we think about this. We think about ubiquitous connectivity, ubiquitous computing. Did you intend that connotation? And uh, I would just maybe flesh that out to mean uh, ubiquitous uh, access is something where users benefit by the ubiquity, even if they're not directly using it. So for the four gentlemen on the panel, what services are facilitated by the suborbital regime which fit that definition? So two-part question, thanks. OK, I'll leave the part two for, for the panel, since you asked me what I meant by, by ubiquitous. I actually didn't mean that everybody would fly in space immediately, just like everybody now has you know, a phone like that. What I did mean is by ubiquity is that it's all around you. Instead of being a rare event to meet someone who's flown in space or a special event, and that kind of person is considered a hero, it's just considered to be something that the 21st century is giving us, and it's all amongst us. And I do think that suborbital can give us that, because the mean free path between meeting people, or uh, the mean free time between meeting people who go in space, can drop from once in your life or twice in your life if the average person in the public meeting an astronaut, to, to bumping into people all the time. That's what I mean by ubiquity. OK, on part two. Not including porn. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm actually having, having a pro problem putting the wording together for this, which is, which is kind of, can you, can you rephrase the question again? So I think I heard mention of an alternative to the pathways through the sky that the FAA currently makes airlines fly. Is there something about suborbital access that facilitates something like that, where we the people can benefit from it even if we're not actually flying ourselves? Well, there, there, first of all, there, there are a lot of um, benefits that are more what we call public goods. Um, a lot of the basic research that we can do on suborbital is going to come back, um, whether it's new medicines, uh, better understanding of atmosphere and weather phenomena. Um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's we don't uh, we don't even know it, but you know, every day, several times a day, there are balloons being released from various places in the U.S. They're getting weather data that affects what airlines make decisions on whether or not they're going to cancel that flight on you or not. Um, 
and, and what routes they're going to try flying between their, their two cities. Um, so in, in a sense, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that are going on that are actually ubiquitous and we have absolutely no clue about um, unless you happen to be in that particular industry. Um, and I think that's where suborbital is really going to be, especially from the re, uh, uh, research uh, field. Um, the science benefits are, are, you know, just truly astounding, some, just from some of the scientists I've talked to about what they can do with that ability to get up there. One of the things that's really come out in the last few years is that, and it's getting tr near to my heart, um, space flight or living in space is very similar to aging. Um, there seem to be a lot of us doing that around here. And the medicine that will come out of that will help us live longer, fuller, richer lives uh, as we learn how to deal with the processes of aging and how to mitigate those. A lot of the process for astronauts to get back into 1G is a lot of the same things that the aging uh, boomers are going to be going through on their own. Okay, next question, Jeff Rukin. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Ashley would like to make an observation. I've been listening to this fascinating conversation within the context of Jim Muncy's comments. You know, Jim talked about the need to get out there and fight the fight. Which new messages, new themes are required to enroll people who don't have the passion that we do, who don't care about space flight, who don't care about exploration. Sam asked a great question about what's being done on the marketing side, and AC hit on one of the problems that the aerospace industry sometimes sucks at branding and getting messages out there. So where I'm going with all of this is I do a lot of economic development consulting work, business development consulting work about the new space industry, and I'm, I'm suggesting and interested in people's opinions for some audiences, it's great to call it suborbital space flight, but for those who don't care about space, don't get space, what I'm finding is calling it suborbital aviation completely changes the conversation, or we heard that before, and gets business people, economic development people, those who want to grow industries and create jobs, to suddenly think about this. And this industry that you are all creating has a way to completely and radically change this conversation in ways that orbital space light just doesn't resonate for people. So I just wanted to put that idea out there that, that sometimes maybe it's more effective to call this suborbital aviation, depending on who our audience is and who we're trying to enroll. Curious what anyone has to say about that, and thank you. Yeah, thank you for that comment. I think it's provocative, and I think there's a lot to that. In fact, Bill Reedy, who uh, used to be at NASA headquarters before that, he was a shuttle commander, and I were just talking about it, and the last email that we exchanged this morning was, you should think of this more like aviation than you should think of it like spaceflight. And it was on the topic of suborbital. So I, I, I largely agree with you. Okay, who else has a question? Right here. I'd like to make a comment along those lines. We have this peculiar expectation that when we go from one place to another, we pay for transportation. But when we get an elevator, it's almost always free. And it, reason is it's, it's one person who owns the resource, he wants to see it used, and so he pays for the elevator, okay? Um, I'm not proposing that you provide vertical aviation for free, but I'm proposing that the concept of vertical aviation, or, as, you know, suborbital aviation, it's just another way to look at its distinctively different thing. Uh, you know, you could also call it black sky aviation, uh, but different perspectives on it may help you see it in a new way that's useful. Okay, I think we've got five minutes, so time for one or two more questions. Taylor? Thanks. Yeah, uh, the uh, one question I have is about the military aspects of this. I mean, uh, suborbital has always been uh, enormously, um, has, has enormous potential for uh, reconnaissance and uh, getting a very high altitude for um, uh, looking into uh, denied areas and on, on demand and so on. So. Uh, how do you see the, um, the DOD's role in this? Uh, well, uh, the DOD is going to be a big customer. There's no question about that. Um, the Air Force has told us that if the Lynx performs the way we say it will, they'll buy two squadrons of them. Uh, it's a huge <laughs> advantage to be able to put a three-quarters of a meter uh, optics with a flat optical window at uh, 350,000 feet uh, four minutes from call-up. 
it's a huge advantage. You can see 700 miles roughly in, in all directions, so a diameter of 1,400 miles. How many vehicles in the squadron? Uh, you'd have to ask the Air Force. I don't know what their, whether they have a different number of squad, you know, on the order of 16 to 20. Uh, I, 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 you want to jump in? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to jump in, too. Uh, serendipitous, my new son-in-law is a now retired Marine, and he gave me a little booklet on what it's like to be a Marine since I didn't know. Um, but an interesting last chapter in that is where they talk about where they're going next. They want to be able to put a unit of Marines anywhere in the world within two hours. That is a huge market for this. The challenge, of course, is to get their links back or whatever the vehicle is from that site. <laughs> okay, the lady in the third row right here in the center section and then a question over here, and I think that's all we're going to have time for. ...with the Open Luna Foundation. And uh, you mentioned what we need to do is be flying, but uh, like Falcon X just flew, and um, I didn't see that much. I uh, don't have a TV working. I just didn't turn it on. Um, if, you know, plugged in or anything. Um, so maybe there's more than I'm thinking, but it's certainly not like 1981 where I was up several nights in a row because 8 a.m. launch in Cape Canaveral was 4 a.m. in Alaska, and... So we're up all night waiting to see this thing lift off, which it finally did. Um, but uh, I don't see that kind of... Um, I didn't even know when the launch was. It was... Yeah, I, I would have had to really work for it. It wasn't out there like it was with the... Uh, so can you frame missions. a question? So how do we get um, this uh, promotion uh, and publicized, like, um, to have that level of energy in it? Okay, AC. My first thought uh, of that is on the suborbital human transportation side. Uh, the way to get that are the passengers. The passengers think you will see the initial pioneers will be celebrities or, or individuals with um, connections to society in terms of um, uh, interactions with media. And, how, and these are potentially customers and passengers who influence the culture in different ways. So I think the passengers will be ambassadors, such as the orbital tourists have been ambassadors when they, once they've come back. Uh, you'll see the same side uh, on the suborbital side. Also, I think another way are the on the payload side, as was said, many of the payloads will be hopefully student payloads. And thus, um, that will be in terms of not this, broad, this high level marketing with very connected individuals, but like lower level marketing of all these students who have all their payloads going on these suborbital rides, who will grow up to be researchers, maybe not in aerospace, but other things, but they will remember that experience, or they'll remember that's possible, and they will become ambassadors for this industry as they go into their professional lives. So I think on the top level in the first few years, you'll have these high, these passengers who are very famous or influential in society. Then you'll have these students who are less influential in society in some ways, but they will, they will also be marketers for this industry. And, and teachers as well. So. Okay, and we're, I know there are a lot more questions, but we are out of time. I know you all want to break. We have one more question right here. Thank you, uh, Jim Caravella. So here's the, the challenge that I see, uh, and there are three issues that, that threads have been uh, pulled together from uh, the conversation just now. So one is the uh, issue of the elevator, basically the free model. The other is the issue of ubiquitous access. And then the other is something AC said earlier about freshness. The risk I see here is that this great uh, idea, and speaking of, uh, say, a five-year forecast on what the market is going to be in terms of suborbital in five years, the risk that we face in this room is that we repeat history again. We create a superb capability, a brilliant technology, and access to uh, new capabilities. Yet our ability in our stuffy aerospace uh, originated culture and mindset is that we don't know how to access the culture that exists in, say, the internet world, the, the younger generation where, uh, the, the, let's say the Facebook generation that is moving rapidly, that needs to be enthused, that needs to be maintained. And I think there's a lot of value in free models, in cross-connecting markets, cross-sector uh, advertising, and cross-sector promotion. And not only 
as the ladies question just uh, just previously how do we get all of this promotion enthusiasm started we really really need an intelligent and sustainable strategy for pushing it forward and i believe that will come and that is a price point issue as well because after 12 24 months we're at risk of having the hype curve and the excitement and the novelty curve dropping off rapidly uh, and if the price point remains in the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands we're at risk of losing a great opportunity uh, in, a, in, a, in the same way. It's just a point. Anybody want to make a comment? Um, I, I'll, I'll make a bit of a comment about that. Uh, back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, I don't remember the exact years, a um, gentleman by the name of Steve Jobs came up with a, a computer. Um, now, the Apple I didn't really make any kind of a splash. I mean, there were only two of them built, but... <laughs> It just, and it really was not a final marketable product. But then he went out and, and, and started and, and managed to find some investment because of the Apple I um, and, and was able to develop this thing called the Apple II. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers, but the big deal was that schools basically got them for a song. And nobody had heard of them except that kids were starting to come home from their junior highs and high schools and saying, hey, I got to play on a computer today. And then, as time went on, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we can have computers in our homes. Four years after that, we have, or, yeah, about, I think it was about four years after the introduction of the Apple II, IBM came out with the PC as a trademarked brand, no less. Um, and, it, and I mean, and so, you know, fast forward 1995, we start seeing where, you know, everybody has computers in around 1995 or so, and the Internet starts taking off. So the whole marketing thing, part of it is, let's face it, nobody has, is flying on a regular basis to the edge of space yet. It's still something that's two or three months in the future for, for many of us. So it's kind of hard to market that. Um, because let's face it, I mean, it, it's something that really annoys me about certain advertising agencies and certain larger companies. They think everybody's an idiot. Guess what? They're not. They they know when you're putting them on. So you got to be very careful if, if you, in order to do a really good job with the marketing and the advertising, you better have the stuff behind it to back it up. Okay, and on that um, strong note, let's say thanks to our participants. Okay, so we're on break. James? All right, thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're, we're now going to take a break down the uh, Apex room, the exhibitor hall, for about a half an hour. And then we'll have an uh, orbital spaceflight panel.